We were sharing in a Bible study yesterday. We've been studying the book of Matthew. And we were looking at the betrayal of Christ by Judas. And we were talking about how those that we love the most and care about the most are the ones that we give our hearts out to, and in doing so, they have the power to hurt us more than anybody else could hurt us. It's just the human condition. Judas came to Jesus to betray him, and he did it with a kiss. And Jesus looked at him and said, friend, why have you come? Now, he said that not because he needed to know why. He knew why he was there. But even in that moment, he was still reaching out to Judas. He wanted Judas to ask himself that question. Judas, why are you doing what you're doing? And what we talked about is how, <laughs> we talked about what Pam just came up and talked about. It's not easy to love people, is it? I mean, there are some that it gets pretty easy to love. I gave my wife, Carla, a promotion this morning. She's the minister of light today. She's running the lights back there because the lady that does it's sick. It wasn't easy for us to love each other early on. I didn't know much about love and how to do it. And uh, God had to teach us how to do that. But once we started bringing things in line with what God wanted, he made it really easy for her and I to love each other. <laughs> but for the most part, it isn't that easy, is it, to love everybody? And yet that's what we're called to do. I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, in honor of the reading of God's Word this morning. I'm going to be reading from 1 Samuel again, chapter 3, verse 19, where it says this, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord continued to appear in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh through the word of the Lord. I'm going to share a phrase with you this morning. It's the title of my message, and I want to share it because it's easy to say, and it'll stick with you. In fact, we were in a Bible study a year or two ago, and a young man brought this up, and he said, shine, don't whine. I was sitting beside him. I said, man, that is awesome. I said, where'd you hear that? He said, from you. <laughs> but I'm glad we had that little incident because for some reason it just wasn't in my memory. And, you know, sometimes when you're preaching, you don't know what you thought and what you actually said. And I must have said it at some point. But God has called us to that very thing, to shine and not whine. We will soon be entering into the Thanksgiving season. And as Christians, our whole lives are supposed to be a Thanksgiving season. Giving God thanks in everything, <laughs> with prayer and praise and thanksgiving, he said, let your request be known unto him. So with that in mind, would you bow your heads? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the love that you love us with. You teach us how to love. You teach us what love is. This world would not know love without the sacrificial giving of the Father who gave His only begotten Son for every man, woman, boy, and girl, that whosoever would come to Him and believe would not perish, but have everlasting life. And Father, You've left us here after our salvation to reach out to every other person that we can to help them to see how much You love them, how much You care about them, how much you desire to be a part of their lives. 
in just how real and awesome and wonderful you are. So, Lord, touch our hearts today. We've gathered together again in your house. And you've promised, Lord Jesus, that where we are gathered, you are there. And you've already been walking up and down these aisles, walking up and down the sanctuary of the, of the aisles of our hearts. And Lord, we just pray now, and we ask you, Holy Spirit, you're the comforter, you're the counselor, you're the teacher, you're the guide. You are the one that has come to dwell in us and to bear the fruit of God. So, Lord, we ask that this word be made alive. And we know how powerful it is already because of the changes that you've already made in each and every one of us. And we come again and ask God, help us to grow in grace and wisdom and in the knowledge of you. That others might see and taste of the Lord and be drawn to your Son who will be high and lifted up because of what he's done for us, what he's doing in us, and what you want to do through us. And I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. You may be seated. We've seen what happens when God's leaders fail, as Eli and his sons did. Not only would they eventually be destroyed by their own disobedience and ungodliness, but they would be a stumbling block to almost the entire nation of Israel. But today we're going to look at and what we're going to see is that even though they were failing God, God was already preparing a godly leader for the people. He was raising up a little boy to become a man of God and that little boy would be the exact opposite of everything that Eli and his sons had been. Samuel would be someone who had a heart and a passion after God and wanted nothing but God's will and God's purpose for his life. I want to go back and look at the scripture I opened up with. It said, Samuel grew. <laughs> Pam talked about how Maybe we've just let things slip just a little bit. Maybe we're not growing like we once were. And I heard somebody say one time, they said, if you've ever been closer to Jesus than you are right now, you're backslidden. You may not be backslidden to the point that you're out of the kingdom and lost. But like my first pastor used to say, Christianity is like riding in an airplane. If you stop, you drop. There's no stopping place in this life and in this world. We've got to keep growing. Jesus referred to us. He was the vine. We are the branches. And if plants aren't growing, they're dying. And if we're not growing in Christ, we're dying. It said Samuel grew. And I love this next part. He said, the Lord was with him. And he let none of his words fall to the ground. I know what he means by that, because sometimes when I'm preaching, my words don't fall to the ground. Sometimes people listen. I was joking with people back in the tech crew there when Brother Steve said, do any of you remember what Pastor Ken said last week? And nobody's hand went out. I said, look, none of them listen. None of them heard it. <laughs> And sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes it feels like it goes out there to there and drops right in front of that communion table. Not always, but sometimes. But what he's really talking about is the anointing and the effectiveness of the things that Samuel would say. How many of you know there are people we listen to and some we don't? Some people, when they talk, it's just noise. But there are other people like E.F. Hutton who demand our attention. <laughs> and there's something different about it, and there's something that gets our attention and, and captivates us. And that's what it's talking about. He let none of his words fall to the ground. Samuel was very fruitful and very effective. In fact, I know that because of what the next word says. It says, all Israel from Dan to Beersheba 
knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. How many of you know that when you love Jesus and you're passionate about walking with him and, and loving him, and he said, if you love me, you'll obey me, and, and you're passionate about obeying him, other people will see that in you. Other Christians will see that in you, thank God. But even more importantly, lost people will see that in you. You can have a dozen people in a room, but if you've got a Christian who is for real, who loves God, who is walking with God, they will stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> I know some of you have had this happen. You've had people walk up to you and say, who didn't even know you. They didn't know you from Adam, as we say, and they said, you're a Christian, aren't you? You didn't have a name tag on. You wasn't wearing a T-shirt that told them, and you know, they, they didn't see the bumper sticker on your car yet. They just knew that something was different about you. And see, that's what was happening with Samuel. And it said the Lord continued to appear in Shiloh. That's great because he'd been missing for a long time. <laughs> because Eli and his two sons, who were everything God didn't want them to be, had closed the door of heaven, as it were. But now as Samuel is in this office to minister and he's walking before the Lord, people are seeing God. And see, that's why it's so important that you and I love God and have a passion for God like he has because people need to see God. And they need to see God in us. We often pray, I do it all the time too, we pray, Lord, we want you to touch Washington County. Lord, we want you to touch this new housing development back here. Lord, we want you to touch people on this side of the world and that side of the world. And you know what God says to us? I told you go. You are my ambassadors. <laughs> Jesus went back to heaven. He ascended to heaven in the clouds, and all the disciples were, wow. Wow. You know what happened? <laughs> Two angels appeared. They said, don't stand here looking into the sky. Some of you are worried to death that the end of the world's coming. You need to worry a little more because you, your end might come a long time before the end of the world comes. Those angels, they said, don't stand here looking in the sky. He just told you, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go do what he told you to do. You need to quit trying to figure out when Jesus is coming anyway. I'm going to preach the gospel to you. It's going to be a surprise. <laughs> In fact, he said, about the time you think you have figured out, I ain't coming. He said, I'm going to come when you think I'm not coming. That's right. Someone once wisely said, they said, there are people that are worried to death about tomorrow who never worry one iota about eternity and where they're going to be with God. That's what was happening in Samuel's life. But what's that passage saying to you and I today? Well, for just a little while, I want you to put yourself in Samuel's place. How many of you know Samuel's a good example of what a Christian should be? And the Bible says that all the things in the Old Testament were written not for even the people in the Old Testament. In fact, in Hebrews it said, they didn't even understand it. They knew it was talking about something, but they didn't know what. And in the New Testament, Paul said, these things were written for you upon whom the ends of the ages have come so that you can learn some lessons from them. And the lessons are the same that Samuel had, the same that he was doing. I want to read to you from John 15. Jesus is speaking to all of us here this morning. And he said, you are my friends, if. <laughs> How many of you know God always has a big if? <laughs> How many of you know everybody's not God's friend? In fact, if you don't know that, you need to go over to the book of James, and he'll tell you 
that if you love the world and the things of the world, you are not a friend of God, you are an enemy of God. But Jesus said, you are my friends if you keep on doing the things which I command you to do. Covenant. I do not call you servants or slaves any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, what, what he's working out. But I've called you my friends. Whew. Think about that. The Son of God, the Word, the great I Am, the one who spoke this creation into existence, says, you're my friend. <laughs> I read in history about heathen gods, and you don't want to be their friend. They want to either cut your heart out or throw you in a volcano because they are not gods. They are inventions of hell. But the God that created it all says, I want to call you friends. Now, if you're going to be friends with somebody, not only do you have to talk with them like Pam talked about. You almost preached my sermon this morning, Pam. Not only do you have to talk to them, you have to be someone that doesn't want to hurt them or do them harm. It's hard to be friends with somebody that they're out to get you, right? He said, I've, I've called you friend because I've made known to you everything that I've heard from my Father, and I re have revealed to you everything that I learned from Him. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. We're friends, and he picked us. He picked us out. You may be here today, and maybe you didn't know who your real parents were, and you were adopted, and some of the family adopted you. Don't think that's a bad thing. It means they picked you. They chose you. Some parents didn't have a choice. They just had to put up with what they got. I was in a restaurant a couple months ago with a friend who actually just passed away this past week. And we were having dinner together, and there was the most beautiful little Chinese girl waiting on us that I had ever seen in my life. And I told her so. And I said, man, I said, your parents must be so proud of you. She said, I don't know who my parents are. She said, I was put on the sidewalk as soon as I was born in China because of their one-child law. But somebody, somehow, some ministry had rescued her off the sidewalk. It, it broke my heart for her to even say that. Think of that. But she said, oh, she says, I'm good. She says, I'm working here. I'm getting to go to college. I got a family that loves me. <laughs> I didn't say it, but I want to think, yeah, when my father and my mother forsake me, God said, I'll take you up. <laughs> He's not only chosen us, you know, like I heard a wise preacher say one time, he said, God hounds us, tracks us down, convicts us, pins us to the ground. The Holy Ghost puts his foot on our throat and says, do you repent? And we do, and then we get up and tell everybody, I found Jesus. No, he, he found you. <laughs> he chased you. <laughs> he dogged you. The Holy Spirit is the bloodhound of heaven. And you're only here today because he came after you. The Bible said there's none that's righteous, there's none that seeks after God. It's a miracle of God that you were drawn by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, no man can get to the Father except through me, and he said, no man can come to me except the Spirit of God drawing. But thank God he did for every one of us. We were so lost, so confused, so in the dark, so without life and he came after us. And he says, I've chosen you, but it doesn't stop there. He said, I've appointed you. Just like he appointed Samuel, he appointed you. He said, I planted you that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing and that your fruit may be lasting, that it would remain, that it would abide. 
so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, not for a Lexus or a Lincoln or whatever, souls. God, you saved me. Can you save my son? Can you save my daughter? Can you save my uncle and my aunt, my nieces, my nephews? Because, God, that's all that really matters when it comes right down to it in this life. God will do a lot of things for us. And he said, when a man's ways please the Lord, he will give him the desires of his heart. And he's a good God. He'll make you feel like an only child. But it's not all about things, and it's not all about you. See, God wants to be with us. He wants to teach us to lead effective and fruitful lives. Dr. D. James Kennedy, who used to pastor Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, and he's now gone on to glory, said this one time. He said, "The, the person who is content to walk the road to heaven alone probably really isn't headed that way. If your Christianity doesn't give you a burden and a heart to want to do everything you can to rescue the lost and the perishing and the people that don't know God yet, if you don't have that, you probably don't really have Christianity yet or you just started. Or maybe you've been in the way a while. I mean, really in the way. And you need to grow. You need to grow. He wants us to be fruitful. That is, He wants us to walk with Him by the Spirit in the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you can't live the Christian life except you be born again and the Holy Spirit takes up residence down inside of you. There's not enough power in you or anybody else or any force in this world to enable you to live for God except the indwelling Holy Spirit. Know ye not that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and you belong to God, but you are no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. The gift is free. Jesus died for you. You could not do that. Nobody else could do that. Salvation is free, but if you receive the gift of salvation, you are no longer your own. (laughs) I led a young man to the Lord in a factory where I used to work years ago, and I said, The Bible said the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I said, you can't do anything. You can't be good enough. There's no work you can do, nothing that you can do to be saved. you got to reach out to God and receive it as a hand of a beggar reaching out to a king. And he gave his heart to Christ, and he lived for the Lord for a year or so, and he come back to me one day, and he said at lunchtime in the factory, he said, you lied to me. I said, what do you mean? He said, you told me it was a gift. I said, it is a gift. I said, nobody could do what Jesus... He said, it's cost me everything in it. I said, oh, you understand that. You're no longer your own now. Heaven's a gift. But God owns you once you accept the gift. You're no longer your own. You don't want to (laughs) be. You don't want to be the old you. God has so much more for you. He has a life. And you know, in America, we have a hard time believing this because everybody wants to be an American idol. We want to be a superstar. You don't have to be a superstar. You just need to be you, but you need to be the best version of you for God. I led more people to the Lord on a daily basis when I was a welder in a factory than I have since I've become a pastor. God's helped us to lead many people to Christ all of us working together. But i got to tell you something. God wants to use you. Jesus said, I want you to bear fruit. I want it to be abundant fruit, and I want it to be fruit that is effective. Remember it said of Samuel, not a word that he spoke fell to the ground. God wants to put the atomic presence of the Holy Spirit down inside of you so full and so real that you'll have the glory of God in this earthen vessel and you will learn to shine in a way that lost people will not be able to not, I know that's not good English, but not be able to see the glory of God shining through you. They will see it whether they want to see it or not. (laughs) 
There's two kinds of fruit that God wants us to bear. One is the fruit of the Spirit. You're a tree. You can't, you can't make fruit happen. You know, you've heard me say this before. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance, and self-control. If you say today, well, one, the fruit of the, they're all one, by the way. Even though they've got all those different names, they're all one. It didn't say fruits of the Spirit. It said fruit. That's the character and the nature of Christ that is down inside of you by the Holy Spirit. But you can't make it happen. So this is the reason you have to obey the Scriptures. If you got up this morning and you said, well, part of the fruit of the Spirit is love. So I'm today going to be the most loving person that anybody runs into. You're going to run into every demon in hell. You're going to run into the nastiest people you've ever met in your life. By the end of the day, you're going to wonder if you love anybody. <laughs> See, you can't make the fruit happen, but here's what happens. Obeying the Word of God is like putting fertilizer on the tree. The Holy Spirit will make the fruit come out of you. He will produce the fruit out of you. You just have to do what the Word tells you to do. And you'll get changed, and you'll get transformed, and that, that fruit will come out. It's the nature and character of Christ. <laughs> I used to be me, but I like being Jesus a lot better. <laughs> and there's times I still want to be me, but the Holy Spirit won't let me. <laughs> I don't want to be me because it's the right thing or it's a good thing. It's because it, that nature dwells in this body that we dwell in. But through the Spirit, we put to deed, uh, to death rather, the deeds of the flesh. I like what one other preacher said. He said, if you're going to crucify yourself, make sure you use rubber nails. But let Jesus do it. He's a carpenter. He knows how to do it. See, the way you crucify yourself is you say yes to God and His Word and no to your flesh. And as you do that, you're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. And you're going to get changed and transformed by the glory of the Lord from glory to glory. I was going to ask you to raise your hand, but you don't have to. You don't have to raise your hand, but I know some of you are as surprised as I am about what God has already done in you. <laughs> Me and a boy I went to junior high school with, my best friend, we used to get in more trouble accidentally than most people do on purpose. I was two years younger than him, and his, his dad was a major in the Air Force, his mom was a teacher, and I was a welfare kid that lived across the tracks. So every time we got in trouble, and he usually instigated it, not because I'm blaming him, but he was two years older than me. He was like a big brother, and he would come up with this stuff, and we'd go do it, and we'd get in trouble, and I'd get punished. You know, and he'd say, don't hang around with that kid cross track. He's making you do bad things. I'm thinking, you better talk to your son, you know. Thirty years later, after I'm a pastor, I ran into this boy's dad in, in uh, I don't know, Sheets or 7-Eleven or something. And he said, Ken, what are you up to these days? I said, Mr. Newman, you're never going to believe it. <laughs> I said, I'm a pastor. You know what he said? He said, yeah, I can see how people like you end up like that. Now, he didn't know. He wasn't a Christian then, and he didn't know it, but guess what God did? He made a pastor out of his son, too. And the two of us together ended up leading him to the Lord right before he died. See, God is a good God. And man, if we'll live for him 
It don't matter how large or small you feel or you think you are in the eyes of others. In God's hand, He will use your life and He will touch people's lives and turn them around. And that's the second fruit. Did you know you and I are supposed to be bearing the fruit of helping to lead other people to Christ? Now, you are. Brother Steve was telling you about 20-something different places. I think there's 22 of them, Steve, last I heard. Could be more. We are reaching people. You are reaching people all over the world. I used to sit and watch TV, and I'd see them St. Jude's children's commercials. I can't watch that one they got now, man. That thing tears me up. But I used to sit there and feel guilty. You don't have to if you come to New Life. If you give it New Life, you give to St. Jude's children. <laughs> There's little boys and girls you're going to see in heaven one day. As Jesus said, if you give a cup of cold water to a little one in my name, you're going to receive a preacher's reward. How do you like that? <laughs> We're supposed to be leading others to Christ. And the way we do that, the most powerful way we do that is by letting Christ live through us and shine through us. But that's why I said shine and don't whine. You know, if you spend life whining all the time, and some of you do, it's going to be hard for other people to see Christ in you. Pam was still preaching my sermon when she said, God will give you hope. You know what a lost world needs? They need hope. And you need to obey Christ and let the fruit of the Spirit flow out of you so that they can see that God is real. And when they see that God is real in you, <laughs> Jesus said, if I be lifted up, not only from the earth on the cross, but if He be lifted up before the world through our lives, He said, I'll draw all men to me. Now, if I drove up on the parking lot, and I was driving a car that had one flat tire and one headlight out of it, and the back of it was all banged up, and it was blowing smoke rings, sounds like my first car. <laughs> and I said, I'm a car salesman. I have 10 of these. Would you like one of these? You're not going to buy it, are you? And see, we go through life whining and complaining and just negative all the time and down all the time. And would you like to come to my church? You can be as miserable as I am. Oh, and I love Jesus, but I'm miserable. I believe in the Bible. It don't work for me, but I... You want some? How many of you know God is a God of hope? He is a positive God. In fact, he said, don't think on things of this earth. He said, think on things above, things that are lovely, things that are pure, things that are good, things that are right. And you say, but Pastor Ken, what about when, when things are going wrong and I'm hurting and, and all these other things are going on? Well, there's places and times for that. God cares about you. He cares about me. We need to care about each other, but you don't need to carry that on your sleeve out in front of the world and everybody else. You say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I've been through either. I've been to eight funerals in the last two weeks, and i got one to go to probably this week or next. Right now, I know of only one. Maybe more than that. What I want you to do is you have to realize you've got to get a bigger view of life than just what's going on with you. Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, if you haven't read it, you need to read it. Forget all the garbage, everybody, the negativity. I, I don't know why Christians, anytime anybody's trying to do something positive, 50 people got to get on YouTube and they got to get on somewhere else and put it down. I want to tell you something. If I don't care what you think of Rick Warren, 
Get that book out, and if you only read one line, read the first line in it. You know what it says? Most of you do, because I say it quite often. It's not about you. <laughs> what does that mean, Pastor Ken? It just means, it means you've got to get a bigger view of life and realize what's at stake in the people that you encounter every day. I think it was with yesterday's Bible study group, I said, you know, God only sees two types of people in the earth, his children and the lost. That's it. And the reason he does is because every human being that's gracing the face of this planet now, ever has or ever will, is going to spend an eternity either in the presence of God or in the absence of the presence of God in hell. And if I'm so consumed with me that I can't be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, I'm missing the whole thing. And in fact, some of you would live a much better life, a much more peaceful life, a much more loving life and caring life if you just forget about yourself for a couple of days. Because that's what God does. He, he turns all that inside out. That's what he meant when he said, if you will lose your life for my sake, you'll find life. I used to be so turned inward and self, selfish and self-centered that I couldn't even see the beauty that you and I live in here in Washington County. This is one of the most beautiful places on earth, and I've been all over the world. I lived in Albuquerque one time, and the first month or two I got out there, I said, man, this is awesome. It's brown, it's cactus, it's that. And about the, about the third month, I said, man, I need some green. I need some mountains. I need... <laughs> this is depressing. <laughs> it's a nice place to visit. I don't want to live there. Many people do. But see, you've got you to gotta, you gotta forget about you for a while and let Jesus live through you and show you how to live for him. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's what Samuel was doing so other people could see God through him. Samuel grew, the Scripture said, in favor with God and man. The Bible said Jesus grew in favor with God and man. How do you think we're supposed to grow? Well done, Pastor Ken. In favor with God and man. You know how you do that? You obey the Scriptures. You just obey them. You say, well, how does it work? I don't know how it works. I just know it does. You just do what God tells you to do, and his word does what he said it would do. <laughs> We're to grow and to learn to shine for Christ. Listen, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, its strength, its quality, how can it its saltiness be restored. It's not good for anything any longer but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. Your salt and your light. Right, Pastor? She said that yesterday in Bible study. Your salt and your light. Salt makes things taste better unless you put so much on it that you can't taste salt anymore. Did you know salt has a law of diminishing return? The more of it you use, the less you can taste it. That's why when you use it a while after a while, you're dumping half the shaker on it just to taste it. Back off a little. That, I just threw that in there. It don't cost you no extra. But see, if salt has lost its saltiness, and sometimes people are salty, but he didn't, he didn't want you to be salty. You know, you run into people and they're like a, a bear with a sore paw all the time. Get away from me. You're giving me a hard time. Want to come to my church? No. I don't even want to be in the same room with you. Jesus said, you're the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp put under a peck measure, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all that are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I don't feel like it today. We walk by faith and not by sight. See, we're not supposed to run around acting like we feel all the time. God help you if I did that. <laughs> I've had people say to me down there, it's best kid, you never have a problem, do you? Whew. I think, dear God Almighty, if they only knew, if they even had the slightest idea. But I say that because there's something bigger going on. God wants us to live every moment of every day to serve and to love others, the people we encounter. I should have just let Pam preach this and been done with it. The people we encounter, and their lives are better because they ran into us. They're encouraged because they ran into us. They have hope because they ran into us. And if they're going to do that, they've got to see that it works in our lives. You can't sell cars if you run around a banged up one. See, even the lost can see the glory and light of God in you if you're living and walking with Christ. They see it. They say, man, there's something different about you. What is it? What is it that makes you different? It's not because you don't have problems. It's not because you don't have trials. It's not because you're, you, know, you, you feel a certain way at certain times, but it's because God gives you the grace and strength to handle it and still shine. Shine, don't whine. Now, this started out as a joke with one of my tennis buddies, but I've adopted. I used to say to him, I said, Charlie, how are you doing today? He said, wonderful and getting better. Living the dream. It's a paradise. You say, well, are we supposed to lie to people? No, they know life isn't, you know, a rose garden. But you don't have to dump on the roses every time they run into you. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> I'm almost done. It's a good thing, ain't it? it Looks like you had about all you can take. In Titus 2.7, it says this, and this is what we're supposed to do. In all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, in other words, living what you believe, gravity. You know what gravity is? I, I joke with my wife all the time. And she, I'm going to have to get her ice cream. I've got to get Cindy ice cream. <laughs> Teresa, she thinks you can put things in the car seat and up on the dash and in the back window, and they'll just stay there. And then I'll stop or turn around the corner. and <laughs> It's become a joke with us now. I'll look at her and I'll say, Gravity. I said, you just, you don't get that whole gravity thing, do you? <laughs> but when it's talking about a Christian having gravity, it doesn't mean that you walk around looking like you've been baptized in lemon juice and brrr. But it means you're serious about what's going on in life. And you know what's going on in life? People are going to heaven and people are going to hell. When you go to eight funerals and you sit there and you hear them all talk about every one of them went to heaven, you're pretty sure some of them didn't. You say, well, how can you say that? Because he said, straight as a gate, narrows the way, few there be that find it. And many people reject God their whole life, but as soon as you die, those people that love you want you to be in heaven. But they're wanting you to be in heaven they ain't necessarily going to get you there. But you need to realize what's going on in this world. I first got saved. I got saved in 1978. Hal Lindsey came out with a book called The Late Great Planet Earth. They were talking about the end of the world. There was not going to be a 1980. I got saved in May. About the middle of June, everybody went on vacation. I come to church. The church is empty. I said, where is everybody? They said, they're on a vacation. I said, on a vacation? I said, Jesus is coming. We're all going to die. And they went on vacation. (laughs) 
Now, it's all right to go on a vacation. In fact, you need a vacation. Not your whole life, just a week or two now and then. And that's okay. But you know what? You got to remember, the devil does not take a vacation. You may not be serious about living for God, but I'm telling you, he is dead serious, no pun intended, about taking people to hell. And God's counting on you to be an ambassador to every person that you live around or come in contact with. I was telling them yesterday in Bible study, you, you know, God's made it a little easier for me making me a preacher. Even when I want to yell at people on the interstate, I'm thinking, don't do it, Ken. The Holy Spirit won't let me do it. He said, don't do it. Now they, they may show up in church next Sunday. They might walk through your door. <laughs> Besides that, I got a new life sticker on the back. They'll be able to find me, know where I live. It says sincerity, and I want to say this next one. I, I got to get done. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Church, I'm going to say it again because I see it all the time on social media. Your language matters. You say, oh, it ain't that, you know, it ain't that big a cuss word. It ain't this, that, the other thing. You know what it becomes? It becomes an excuse for lost people to say, they ain't no different than I am. I don't have to change. I don't have to do anything any different. They go to church, listen to them, potty mouth. You're a Christian and you don't understand you can't have a potty mouth anymore? Do you read any of the book? <laughs> it matters. They came to Peter, remember? When Jesus was being tried and he was out by the fire with the little maid and he'd already told Jesus, I'll die with you. She said, ah, you're one of them. You're one of them. I seen you in the garden, man. You cut a guy's ear off. You know what the Bible said? He started cussing. And when he started cussing, you know what they all said? Man, yeah, he ain't a follower of Jesus. <laughs> That's what they're saying when they hear you do it too and see you posting on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and whatever all that other stuff is. <laughs> Twitter. It matters. People, see, here's the thing. If you can't picture Jesus doing it, don't do it. I mean, that's pretty simple. Somebody was arguing with me years ago. They said, oh, you can smoke cigarettes and go to heaven. You, you can drink beer and go to heaven. I said, let me get you a 16 by 20 picture of Jesus with a cigarette and a Bud Light. Hang it in your house. See how you feel about it. Oh, I, don't, I wouldn't want that. I said, no, and God don't either. I mean, come on. Come on. I spent almost the last 43 years of my life trying to convince church people, you really have to do what the Bible says. You know what it said? Sound speech that cannot be condemned. <laughs> Every once in a while when I'm on the tennis court, I'll, I'll say something, <laughs> and one of those guys will go, did you cuss? I thought, no, and why would you think I would? You know why? Because they're watching. They're watching. They, they're watching our lives. And you say, well, because they don't like Christianity and they don't like it. No, it's because they won't see if it's real or not. And if it isn't real in you who profess it to the world, how in the world are they ever going to see it and find it? Whew. It said, sound speech, it cannot be condemned that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed having no evil thing to say of you. You say, well, people always criticize you. No, listen to this. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. They may not like you. They may not like your God. They may not want to come to your church, but they'll see Jesus in you. God wants us to walk in his anointing and favor and bear much fruit. That's what I'm trying to say to you. What I'm trying to say is a shine don't whine. <laughs> Say it with me. Shine, don't whine. I just infected you. The Holy Spirit's going to bring that back to you this week every time you start to whine. <laughs> Worship team, would you come to the platform, please? See, people are watching our lives. They're watching our actions. They're watching our attitudes. They're watching our words. They're watching to see if the God we really serve is enough. 
is enough. He is the way. He is the truth. And He is the real life. And we've got to live it in a way that other people can see it in us. All the time. Everywhere. In the line at Walmart. In the waiting room at the doctor's office. On the highway behind the steering wheel. In the school in our homes, in church even. How about it? How about it? In church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we cry out, holy, holy, holy are you God Almighty. Father, thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that he came down to this earth to create a way for us to be in heaven with you. Father, it's my prayer that everyone under the, under the sound of my voice, Lord, that we shine for you this coming week. That when we shine, that the people in our lives see you, not us, but you. It's my prayer, Father God, that they see a reflection of your word in us, in our actions, in our words, in our deeds, Father God, in how we care for other people. Let them see the reflection of Jesus in us. Holy Spirit, just come. Bathe us in the Holy Spirit right now, I pray. Everyone in this sanctuary, Holy Spirit, just come. Immerse us in your Holy Spirit right now. Empower us to do your will this coming week. Help us to resist and flee temptation when it comes. Help us look for opportunities to serve you and to honor and bring glory to your name at our workplace, at our home, at the grocery store, Father God. Lord, be alive. Be a fire that burns deep inside of us that we can't extinguish and that others see and they want to know what is inside of us. Lord, I thank you for this time with my brothers and sisters. I ask that you have your hand upon them. I pray for healing, Father God, for those who need healing, physical healing, emotional healing. I pray for marriages, Father God. I pray for those who are in financial difficulties. And I pray for, Lord, for those who have addictions, struggles, and trials, Father God. Life is real. Nothing is impossible with you, though, Father God. Show them that you're there with them every step of the way in life, Father God. Go with each one of us now, Father God. In Jesus' name, amen.